Hello, my friends. Dr. K, Digital Circuit Rider again, uh, coming to you this time. I'm, we're, we're at Lake Wakanda, uh, pretty much in central Kansas. Beautiful place. I wanted to call it Lake Wobegon for those of you who used to listen to his telecast, but it's not. Um, let me set this up a little bit. This is different, not only because of the location, but because of what we're doing. It's very special. I'm going to, uh, for the first time ever, I'm going to overview in like 40 minutes the entire book uh, that just got published January 30th, The Sixth Seal 2. And I'm going to lay the foundation for the background of how all my thinking and writing went. I'm not going to do the testimony thing. I don't have time. I'll get to that some other day. Uh, and then I, after I lay the foundation and review the contents, the major points and subpoints of the book, uh, I'm delighted to say another video will follow me from my dear friend and professional retired professional counselor, Rosalind Downer. I just listened to her presentation. It is superb. Uh, practical and spiritual information that you've got to have that I have not been able to give you. So you're going to get a, a double-fisted one today, and I, I hope that you uh, listen to it, read it, and also uh, share it with your friends and even your pastor. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as I said uh, to my friends here, this is all for you. You're the king. We want to glorify you. Whatever is done well here today, we up front, we front load the point that you get the credit, you get the glory, you get the honor. Anything we do well down here is because of you. So we thank you to keep us true, keep us straight, keep us loving, and bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Title of my uh, overview today is Overview of the Six Seal Two. Again, I repeat myself, but then I'm almost 80. Uh, Glen Elder, Kansas. I'm going to keep this on record because I think this might be rebroadcast re some other time. Anyway, background. Here's where it started for me. July, I think it was near the July 4th, which is my wife and uh, my uh, wedding anniversary. <clears throat> July 1985, I'm at the house of a, a former uh, 700 Club hostess, Danuta Soderman, and her Swedish husband named Kai Soderman. We did not, we did not know each other well. In fact, we had clashed a little bit. I had her lecture in one of my classrooms, and it didn't go well as she presented kind of a uh, a secular approach to knowing reality. Anyway, we tried to make rapprochement. We got together. They invited us to the house for dinner. And uh, toward the end, it was fairly amicable. At the end of the dinner, though, it was about 10, 11 o'clock at night in the middle of Chesapeake, Virginia, nice little cottage in the middle of the country. Kai Soderman comes back. He says, Cliff, come back to my office. I have a word for you. And I, I was still new enough at this. I'm not sure I understood what he meant, the accent notwithstanding we went back in the room and i've written it down so i get it right this is july 1985 cliff you will write one book only one book and it will have clouds and lightning on the cover and he excused himself and said good night uh i wrote that down somewhere completely forgot about it for 30 years or more but little did i know when it actually came time to write that book this is not in the script uh, in, thinking about it at least in 2015, not knowing the events that would unfold that uh, I'm going to talk about and Rosalind will talk about later, regarding Donald Trump. Donald Trump has changed my life. If, whether you realize it or not, he's changed your life. Question is, how? For the better or for the worse? So let me go right to the book in terms of uh, reviewing the contents and I'll develop this idea and this argument as we go. The first part of the book is very brief, Prelude, God's Timeline. <clears throat> this was not ever published before. It took me 40 years or more to get a sense of, look, God created history in a, in a linear fashion. It is not circular as most of the Eastern folks want to tell us in the New Agers. It is linear. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's the way we logic uh, reality. That's the way we understand. It's one of the reasons I love to look at origins so much. Uh, Rosalind could talk endlessly about family of origins, how important it is, those first four or five years of our lives. Everything has a beginning except for God. Everything has a middle and everything has a terminus, a telos, an ending, a consummation. So I'm not sure I could exactly say how this timeline 1900 to 2020 came about over the last few years, but it became very clear to me. And it was based on the Noahic concept in Genesis 6, 1 through 3. 
When men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and they took wives of all they desired and chose. We could do a massive teaching on that alone. Ain't going to do it. Here's the line. Here's the key. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not forever dwell and strive with man, for he also is flesh, but his days shall yet be, in the future, 120 years. That a number of interpretations could be uh, laid laid at the footstool of that. The one I'm taking away, and most expositors understand, is that God has a pattern to some degree, not always, <clears throat> that he will strive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Only when I talk from the cameras, I, <clears throat> that he will strive with man, a group of men, a nation, for 120 years. That uh, You can call that sort of a uh, a margin of grace that God will deal with and somehow again strongly impressed that America's final warnings began subtly and then increased in intensity which is also his methodology under the guise and the rubric of birth pains they developed more strongly so when 2020 came I didn't know any of this when he said I was gonna write a book that 2020 was a, a Rubicon if you understand Roman history a little bit it was a line beyond which once crossed, you cannot go back. Um, so I, I, it was one of the generals in Rome. I can't remember the name and the details, but that's that's where we're going with this. So the turning point, actually, it's a twofold turning point for me. Again, in reflection and hindsight, are two factors on which the book is based. Uh, one, Donald John Trump. Two, COVID nineteen. These two forces of nature, if you will, of human nature and medical nature collided in such a fashion between the ears of 2017 and 2021. I've literally subtitled the book uh, with those two uh, bookends, if you will, uh, on, on, the, on the subtitle. Uh, in the first book, <clears throat> I use the phrase in the introduction, the end of history as we know it. Uh, without knowing that those were going to be the, the bookend years that I was talking about. And I mean that. It's not, a, it's not hyperbole. The, the end of history, normalcy, normal times, as we have known them, is now at very close to its end. Uh, Rosalind will detail some of that in, in her own way uh, after me. This is a terribly important... In fact, in my concluding remarks uh, in the book... I get to the point now, I'm not predicting when the Lord's coming back, I'm not predicting the rapture or anything like that, although I have a lot of theology laid down in the uh, one of the sections of the book about how I came to this. I believe that the years 2025 and 2030, this is presupposing Donald Trump is going to be elected, I, <laughs> I just don't see how he's going to be beaten. And if he's not elected, his friends... Uh, already have plans for taking the election back. I'm not exaggerating. From 2025, therefore, to 2030, we'll decide the fate of the nation and the world. That's how important this is. I've been teaching 44 years uh, at universities all over the country, both secular and Christian, and I have never made a statement even close to that ever. It would have been irresponsible for me even a few years ago. That's how important those five years are going to be. Uh, Interlude. The second part of the book then is basically a restatement of the Sixth Seal that was published, the first one, in 2017. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, I have several things I could mention here. Let me just take a moment. Uh, yeah, uh, I started the book this way. And when I started drafting it in 2015, uh, the first line just came to me. I don't, I, I don't want to lay it at the Lord's responsibility if it's not, but I think it is. And this is what I wrote. The word is on the world. Mistake already. The world is on fire. The world is on fire, and the Messiah is coming soon. I literally reeled at that. I pulled back from the laptop. I said, "I can't write that." Back in 2015, things were pretty okay. You know, things, the economy. Uh, we didn't have the division we have. I mean, I, I literally expressed out loud. I don't remember the wording. God, this, this can't be right. And the impression was, write it down. Uh, which is what I did in the first in the first edition. Uh, I'm going to skip over all of this because it's uh, not necessary. I'm going to go to section two, the postlude, which is 
the 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 last third of the book the first two set the first section is pro, uh, prelude is brand new second session is an edited recomposition of the original book without changing anything prophetic that would have been irresponsible and then third the postlude that's what i'm going to concentrate on today i don't know that i need to go the full time but uh um, looking at the time now yeah we're in good shape all right postlude introduction I start with a line, the day the earth stood still. For all those sci-fi fans of yours, there is a movie, I think might have been of that name, that's the phrase that came. And I, and I tie the day the earth stood still for me to June 16th, 2015. Uh, that's the day, and it's not necessarily in the script, that I watched on TV with my wife, Donald Trump come down that golden escalator in New York at Trump Tower. Uh, I almost as an afterthought. I've never followed Donald Trump. He's never a, a glimmer of thought in my mind. I said, honey, come in here. You got to listen to this. And I listened to, I think, 2.3 minutes and I shut it down. Uh, I said, Pff. I mean, I, I was so wrong. I shrugged it off. Great scholar and prophet that I am, and I'm not. Never claimed that. Uh, I, I thought this is the babble of a seven-year-old on his best day. This can't possibly be the future president of the United States. I've never been so wrong in all my life. In fact, I will just front load my thesis for you uh, when I go to the first seal uh, of the book of Revelation, uh, of the book of Revelation, chapter six, which both books are all about. The six seals uh, in that chapter. I now believe, and Rosalind will mention it in her way a little bit later, that the first seal that describes the Antichrist uh, in Revelation 6, 1 through 2, says this, uh, whoever that person is, and it's no secret, you already know who I think it is, uh, he's lawless, he's a destroyer, these are all biblical descriptions, he opposes God, he is a deceiver, he is arrogant, he is a heretic, and this is what most Christians don't realize. He's a politician. I've had so many pastors or church leaders say, well, why are you wasting your time looking for the Antichrist? I mean, that, that's a spirit, you know, that, that, that involves this and that involves that. That political idea, though, is absolutely central to your understanding of who it, who it is and where he's going to take us. The second, uh, the thesis that I have, therefore, and I jump to that, Donald John Trump is in historical and theological fact, been looking at this stuff for 44 years, never even come close to proposing something so radical. And it is radical. These are radical times. Uh, and I'm speaking rather intensely, more intensely than I ever have before because of that fact. Uh, I've studied uh, American culture, politics, and history for 50 years, really. And uh, there's never been a time like this. So here's my thesis, Donald John Trump, is in my view historical theological fact the antichrist he's the guy uh operating in the very spirit of antichrist described clearly in john 2 22 and 4 2 and 3. Uh, i'll go through today and rehearse for you or review for you i should say the specific scriptural characteristics of why i make that claim and i'm not the only one i know a number of you watch uh, brother paul's antichrist 45 channel excellent excellent stuff and I and I recommend it so the first uh, the first seal is Antichrist and the second seal that I deal with in more detail now in the second edition is uh, in Revelation 6 3 and 4 is war uh, one of the things I do and I'll tell you a little bit more about that when I go to a small town or a small regional area like this I love to just spot street interview Steve Allen used to do it on his old show way back in the I guess it was the 50s uh, I just ask people their opinion. I've done that again. Wherever I've gone, I've traveled between 30 and 40,000 miles in the last three or four years as a circuit rider around the country, coast to coast. I shouldn't say this. The only place I haven't gone is New England. I'll let you decide why. Um, I ask people, especially military and police, but mostly military, just did it again this weekend. Of the three hot spots that are on the globe right now, what are the ones that you consider the most immediately dangerous? So far, we've got 98% or higher of maybe 25 people over a couple of years saying uh, South China Sea, Taiwan, that's next. They're preparing for it. They've already wargamed it, uh, that you can read the news about it. 
that's what's coming first. But I, uh, in, in this book, I outline five last wars of history that remain unfulfilled biblically. They are, very briefly, I'm not going to go into detail, one, Civil War. If you haven't seen the movie Civil War, uh, I mean, it's got some fallacies and foibles in it, but it's a chilling reminder of what is coming. Uh, it's not exaggerated. I know the projection of a certain mentality in America today that's been here for a very long time is going to take that form, I think, as the first thing we're going to have to contend with. Second, Psalm 83 war. I'm not going to go into detail about that. There are some who argue that the wars going right now, on right now in the Middle East, are very, very close to a description of the Psalm 83 war. Isaiah 17 war is next, and, I, and I'm saying this in some sequence, and I argue in the book for why I'm doing that without trying to be a military strategist, just using common sense and reasoning. The Isaiah 17 war is the never fulfilled, complete and utter destruction of the city of Damascus. You can argue with me till you turn blue. It's never been destroyed. It's never been uninhabited in the description of Isaiah 17. My view, as I recall, is that Israel is going to be forced to the wall and may well take that city out with a, with a nuclear detonation. I don't know that speculation, but that's obviously going to trigger the last two wars. Uh, Israel is already hated as never before because of the Gaza war. That particular one will pretty much unplug all the rest of the fuses. That's followed by, I think, much later, uh, uh, frankly, I think the church will not be here to see it, the Ezekiel 38-39 war, where an assembly of a, mm, a Russian-Turkey-led coalition, including Muslim countries, Arab countries, will finally try to completely flood, flood from all directions Israel. They would have been utterly destroyed uh, except for the interposition of Almighty God in that war, uh, he literally rains uh, fire and brimstone and uh, causes them to start killing each other. He wipes out seven-eighths of that standing army of millions. Um, and that's when I believe Israel begins to understand that Yahweh and Yeshua ben David are the same. Um, though different, they're the same. So uh, the final one is Armageddon at the very end of everything. But I have a chronology at the end of the book that that's not the finish of it either. Armageddon doesn't end everything. Um, so that's the second seal war. You don't have to read my book to understand that war is at our door, uh, both domestically and internationally. Third, the third seal is, goes by several labels, uh, scarcity. Rosalind Downer will detail uh, what that's going to look like. And so... Uh, you might, you might want to get a grip on yourself before you listen to it, but it's, again, it's not hyperbolic. This is what's coming under a Trump America. Uh, Revelation 6, 5 and 6, uh, another little mistake here. Uh, descriptive of scarcity of goods and services, the possible, at least temporary, annihilation of them, where you won't be able to get goods and services and power. Second, economic collapse. I've read, I've reviewed and since 2015, no fewer than 50 economists. I'm not an economist, but again, I can read and I can think. I would say that conservatively 75% or higher of all those in the last nine years that I've been reviewing them say it's inevitable. There's a massive collapse, they call it a correction, coming that's going to make look, 2008 look like Sunday school. So that's coming which is one of the reasons my wife and I decided not to buy a small town home. Rates are at 6-7% despite the incentives. Um, to get a small 12, 1300 uh, square foot home right now will cost you with a good healthy down payment of 25% or more, $3,700 a month. I ain't buying. My dad was a real estate man. He said, son, everything that goes up must come down. Wait till it crashes. So, uh, I'm not sure we'll be here long enough to worry about it, but we're going to stay in a lease for now. Um, okay, that's the third seal, scarcity. Oh, yeah. Then I have a section, a subsection, the new anarchists. And I'm not talking about the guys who are going to come pounding on your door and take everything you have. It's interesting. The economists call the new anarchists what I call venture and predatory capitalists in relation to Bitcoin. Bitcoin, without being an expert, is both economics and and uh, scam 
I've seen that written by some of the top. I, if you have money in Bitcoin, get the blank out of there as soon as you can. Uh, my book goes into it just a little bit of detail about where to put your money. I know Rosalind and I have had a talk. The first thing that uh, my wife and I are discussing, because we she has a small uh, inheritance in the bank. A lawyer told me, not a, a believer, just a, a nuts and bolts, hard street, street uh, shoes on the street lawyer said, you do not want to have most of your holdings in a bank account with what's coming. And uh, that was about 12 years ago. Uh, think that through as well. Uh, fourth seal, plague. Well, we got a good taste of it, didn't we? Or a very bad taste of it with COVID-19 exploding in late 2019 and then proliferating throughout the planet uh, throughout 2020. It spawned, unfortunately, a church-based anti-vaccine movement that is a new religion now. It's still very much alive. I just uh, sent one of their uh, posts, uh, not a nasty little, old, but a blunt force, you know, you guys are basically crazy. Uh, you don't cite any evidence. They always say, well, more people have died of the vaccine than have of COVID-19, which is not even worth responding to. You can go to any medical site, any objective site, any encyclopedic site. I don't know the world numbers, but I know that 1.3 million Americans are dead because of COVID and not receiving the vaccine. Uh, I'm sure there are deaths by the vaccine in a minority report of some kind, but you know, it saved my life. I remember I went, I got COVID in uh, December 2019. I went into the hallway, had a great staff that was working 20 hour days. They were exhausted. And the guy who's much younger than I across the hall didn't make it. Um, so I was in the hospital in the middle of the breakout of that thing and certainly got my attention. Uh, so the fourth seal plague, coronavirus was, was a, a harbinger, a, war, a, a warm up call. Uh, I have two sections I'm not going to explain them. Lost theology is one section for the basis of this stupid anti-medical uh, cabal, this cult now that's formed. So stop taking all your uh, pox vaccinations. Stop taking all your vaccinations. See how that goes for you in a world that's headed for plague. See how that works out for you. Um, grid failure. I had a section in the first book, repeated a little bit in the section. Texas had... Uh, a real, real taste of that when their grid went down. I remember when researching the grids, by the way, that I found out there are three grids in America, three. There's the eastern grid and the, uh, the western grid that covers about two-thirds of the country and a Texas grid. <laughs> they have their own and they're real, real excited about that. At least they used to be. Uh, so grid failure, again, Rosin will talk about the implications of grid failure. Um, let's see, I'm trying to keep my place. The consequences. The consequences is a subsection where of these first three seals alone in the fourth seal, there's war going on, the Antichrist is in power, stripping us of our rights. There is economic collapse in stages, not all at once, likely. And all of this, all of this is going to add to the uh, proliferation of plague and illnesses, unfortunately, with the cooperation of much of the church, unless they wake up by that time. Um, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, so hell and death are also the subtitles you'll find in most scriptures to describe the four. We're getting really, really, really serious now in the fourth seal. And yeah, I believe and I teach that Christians will be here for those first five seals. That's why... I'm a modest prepper. Rosalind's harder core. You take your pick. They're both uh, they're both good suggestions for you to prayerfully consider. Uh, fifth seal, martyrdom. Now, I've had these arguments for, with Christians for many years, uh, the last ten anyway, but especially in the last six. Martyrdom is going to come to the church as never before. You'll read in the later chapters of the Book of Revelation that millions upon millions upon millions of Christians, true Christians, will go to slaughter by the blade, by, by the guillotine, by uh, beheading. That's all true. That's literally true. My teaching is that there will be limited martyrdom before that stage in the last three and a half years of the tribula tribulation takes place. All the arguments and documentation are in the book. So if you don't agree, that's fine. That's fine. But uh, there will be, however, 
limited martyrdom. And I must say, if Donald Trump takes office, as I expect he will, at about 98% probability one way or the other, people like Rosalind Downer, Cliff Kelly, uh, Brother Paul, although he's very wise to stay anonymous, pseudo pseudonymous on, online, uh, without the direct cover and intervention of God, people like us who are public uh, will be gone. And we're, we're uh, soberly ready and readying ourselves for that. I'm not, I'm not naive much anymore. This is what he's going to do. And uh, again, Rosalind will comment on that a little bit later. Excuse me, dry throat whenever I talk. Mm. Martyrdom, the former days uh, that I have a historical review. I love history, so I have a historical re review that includes subsections on the birth of persecution in the ancient world, medieval martyrdom, progress to the 21st century, and then the latter times that it brings us up to date to the present day that I talk about the origins of the last day's persecution in some ways beginning with as a harbinger of bloody, bloody, brutal harbinger was uh, Shoah, the Holocaust of the Second World War. That's what's coming back, and it won't be just for Jews. It'll be for Jews and Christians and some ancillary groups around that, never Trumpers, that sort of thing. And then I get to uh, review here 10 traits of the man of sin, because a lot of my book focuses again and again more intensely, like with a microscope, on the Antichrist, Donald Trump being that individual. Uh, Brother Paul in Antichrist 45 uh, on YouTube uh, and two other theologians with doctoral credentials who basically agree with Paul, written completely independently of that. I think it was, uh, jo was it Jobert who said, what I tell you three times is true? Maybe No, no, it wasn't him. It was, um, I always forget names in front of the camera. Um, even the Bible says every fact should, and truth should be confirmed by two or three witnesses. And so I agree with that from a journalistic point of view. So I look for corroboration very important principle. Here's what he lays out in agreement with two, uh, I think, wise theologians. The Antichrist will have the mouth of a lion. I'm going to ask you to think Trump here. The Antichrist will be boastful and arrogant. Any questions or arguments there? I didn't think so. Three, he will deny the Father and the Son. At some point, he'll continue to say more and more, he is their replacement. Four, he is a vile person in the, in the absolute sense of that term. Next, he throws two, truth to the ground. I mean, ever since, you know, fake this, fake news, fake everything, which is a projection <coughs> of what he's doing, I'm pretty sure he borrowed the concept, as he has borrowed several concepts from Nazi Germany in World War II, Lebens, no, no, it's not Lebensraum. Uh, there's a German word for uh, lying press, the media, lying press. You pull that uh, uh, right from uh, Goebbels' uh, teachings on propaganda. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll remember the, the German term as soon as I'm done. Lugenpresse, Lugenpresse, false press, false media. Uh, where am I? He comes in his own name. Trump, 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 Trump. Uh, again, uh, Brother Paul makes excellent illustration of this. He has a covenant with many. Now that's, that gets us into two or three different levels. I'm not sure this section of the book mentions the uh, Abraham Accords, but that's a big deal. Uh, that's a very big deal. So, and it's yeah, it's halfway point. It's not fully developed yet. Uh, so keep an eye on that. He loves uh, personal. Uh, this must be personal aggrandizement. That was a mistake. There. I have to go back. Uh, and then I get to a personal in. Oh, oh, oh! Excuse me. Ah, I skipped the whole line. Uh, he honors the God of forces. He's all about an unprecedented, powerful United States military. In some ways, I'm for that as well. I've always believed that a strong defense is a strong capability for uh, military, military superiority. So I'm not arguing that point, but he literally operates from an algorithm that's driven by personal power. And the extension of that is a military and a police force that is, is under his thumb, under his control, under his mandate uh, and his will. Uh, he's called the Little Horn. I don't know if Paul is 
Uh, Brother Paul is, is, is right in this, but it's interesting. He did a word study in the Greek and found that the little horn translates literally as trump or trumpet, both terms. So uh, that was kind of interesting. And a personal illustration of mine, uh, looking at the time, I'm still good, uh, is I call myself sometimes not to pat myself on the back, but it just is. First canary in the coal mine, I was working at Liberty University. Most of you heard a little bit of this story in the year 20... I started in 20, 2006, and it was 2016 at this point. I got, a, I got an admin email, very clinical and sterile, that I was fired. Um, and it gave, me, it gave me something like a 40% cut in pay and a rollout contract that would end in 2017. I uh, took the wind out of this old man's sails, and so I called admin. I tried to contact Jerry Falwell Jr., who at that time was president of the university. I talked to vice presidents. I talked to personnel heads. Couldn't get any answers except something amorphous like, well, there's a financial exigency. At the time, I've done the homework. We had a $1.3 billion uh, fund uh, at the university's uh, behest, uh, and so that didn't wash. I really didn't take long to understand that because I had been writing uh, very small commentaries at that point, on occasion against Trump, uh, that Jerry Falwell Jr., of course, came out, you know, tenfold for Trump in January 2016, three months before I.E. let me go, and basically called him God's answer for a president. So I had known Jerry Falwell Jr. and his wife Becky for, I don't know, several years. I kind of was a fan of his. I liked the fact that he was an attorney and he spoke intelligently, he had a dry wit. I liked all that and he was getting rid of a lot of the debt in the university. So I liked all that, had no idea who he really was underneath and the whole world knows who he and Becky ultimately became underneath. So I was fired as a first canary of sorts, I wasn't the only one, I'm sure. <clears throat> An early warning. If you're a public and you're against Trump, man or woman, doesn't matter, buckle your bootstraps, Bonnie, because he'll come after you. I know that that probably explains 90% of many Christian men staying quiet because they, they want to keep their jobs. I'm neither supporting that or offending that right now. I know that I was pretty much, I, I didn't think twice of it. Uh, I was raised in a non-Christian household where truth and honor was uh, vaunted. My dad was a World War II Navy submariner. He wrote to me, best man I ever knew. And um, he's just a good man. Uh, and uh, I won't go into that further. I've done that a couple of times. So everybody's going to be having to make a decision after the election. I mean a decision of your lifetime, second only to becoming saved. Uh, it won't escape anybody. Um, so, implications of that? Uh, that's a facsimile of my own experience of Hitler's Third Reich, which I believe will become more and more America, the Fourth Reich. Six seal, cosmic shift. Now, this is where everything stops and changes. This is where history, as we have known it, ends. This is the end of the Age of Grace. It's the end of the Church Age of 2,000-some years. It is the end of normalcy. It is the end of America having a pretty good time, la, la, tra, tra, no matter what. This is where everything stops. The sixth seal is the great pivot, the historical, the theological, the spiritual pivot. So what I'm going to do, I think I do, uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it into the record one more time. It's that important. I've read it twice before in the last couple of years. But you have to understand, at least from my point of view, I believe after 40 years of study, I've come to this position that this is, this is, this is the great, great turning point in all of human history. Uh, here's what the Word says in Revelation 6, 12 through 17. I looked when he that is Christ opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, I mean worldwide earthquake, 
and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll. Never been able to conceive of that. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and every island was moved out of its place. Geologists ponder that. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Who is able to stand? Only those who are truly, fully in Christ. I refer to that church, the true church, as the remnant that's still alive when, when Christ's wrath comes. I believe, I don't have the scripture here in Ephesians, that we are not appointed to God's wrath. We're appointed to all of Satan's wrath, all of man's wrath, all of the foolishness that we call down on ourselves. <laughs> we don't escape any of that. We don't escape any of the first five seals. That's why preparation is so needed. But when God spills forth his terror, I'm sorry, everything I've read for 44 years tells me that's not for me. If you want him to, if you want him to spill that wrath on you and go through all this, maybe you can pray him into, into agreement with you. I'm not going to try. Uh, this is not escapism, except it's de as defined in the New Testament. I believe and teach, therefore, that as maybe just a split second before this happens, God withdraws his church from that. And that's where, at the very least, the most intense three and a half years or, mo or seven, depending on your eschatology, that's when all hell and heaven collide on the earth, both. And there's never been anything like it before. There will never be anything like it again. So things to watch for that are run up to that, uh, earthquakes, the sun uh, behavior, the moon turning like blood. We've had several of those stars, stars comets. Uh, can't remember his name. Uh, uh, Goodman, I think, has written a book on uh, a scientist who studies celestial events. The sky recedes like a scroll, mountains and islands. Okay, I'm not going to go through all that. This is the onset of divine terror. Nothing you have experienced or I've experienced is like unto that. We don't have, we don't have a precedent for that. So just uh, leave you with that. Then finally in this section, I summarize, and it's taken me four decades to get to this. Again, going back to the point where God has created history in a linear fashion. There is a rough chronology in the scriptures. I know Old and New Testament, they go back and forth and you can't read it that way. But in the last days, I've, I've just seen it uh, after decades of scrutiny. I see a rough chronology of events that are pretty clear to me in Scripture. So this is my take of what's coming, where we are now, what comes next. First of all, birth pangs. We're there. The opening of the seals. That's my teaching, not the six, of course, but those first five seals. Antichrist is already on site, as they say, in police quarters. Uh, he's here. And a, a number of us, not a large number, have named him. First birth pangs, you're in it now. If you're wondering why things are so nuts, these are, these are warnings. These are birth, birth tremors. Um, goes by some other names, um, the time of sorrows. Um, that's where we are right now. Two, second, the apostasy of the church. In that shaking, in those birth pangs, the Lord is like, got a great sieve in heaven. And he's sifting his people, not the liberals and not the pagans. No. First to us, judgment comes first to the house of God. Pastors, I wish to God you'd listen up. He's sifting you primarily and all of your congregation and me and my Aunt Tilly, and I don't even have an Aunt Tilly, in his great, great threshing, uh, threshing boom. And he's looking to see who's wheat and who's chaff. He's, that's going on right now. I am appalled that at least 80 plus percent of the American primarily white church is not making the cut. You're not making the cut. That means you don't get to go. Oh, well, I'm going to vote for Trump because he's anti-abortion. 
try to sell that at the judgment to the Lord. Well, I voted for the Antichrist because he had a couple of policies that I liked. I I encourage you maybe to change that view. Um, so the sifting is going on right now. Uh, in terms of I lost my place again, the apostasy, the the great falling away of the church is already happening. You have to be blind, deaf, and stupid not to see that happening. Uh, churches will either go silent on the rise of Antichrist, which they've pretty much done, or worse, I guess, worse, they are advocating for Trump, and they're hanging flags and Trump signs outside the church, believe it or not, got pictures to prove it. This is insanity. I'm in the middle of the country here. I've traveled the country over and over again. I've never seen one Biden sign in the United States in four years. Not one. I just heard this morning, uh, uh, truth be told, that I interviewed, and I'll maybe talk a little bit as I close about the other interviews, little... Uh, some white folks sitting at the table in my motel. They were discussing some pretty serious stuff. I think I shouldn't have interrupted them. Anyway, I introduced myself and said, I just want to ask you one question, Trump or Biden. The first man, angry face. First time I've ever heard it. I'm not voting for a criminal. The second lady said, no comment. Third lady said, no comment. And the fourth guy was from the, 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 uh, the UK. He says, I'm a monarchist. I believe in George III. So <laughs> I said, you know, I thought about it. Maybe we would have been better off. Other than that, uh, three policemen, I got pulled over three times in this crazy ride. It turned out fairly well most of the time, and I interviewed each of those cops. The first one said, dropped his head and said, yeah, it's just my opinion, but I'm a Republican. That was the end of the statement. He's going to vote for Trump because he's a Republican. No reflective thought about that. I'm not even putting him down. This is what I hear. The second guy, um, oh no, the second was a, a precious lady in her 50s who owned an electronic shop where I had to get a, an attachment for my iPhone. I won't name her. Lovely lady. And I said, uh, how about you? Which way are you going to vote? She said, well, Trump. I would never vote for, I'm trying to remember how she described Biden which is representative of everything I've ever heard before. Oh yeah, she brought up Biden, Obama, and Hillary in the same brief discussion. And those are the reasons she's voting for Trump. Um, and she said uh, on the tag end of that, we here in the Midwest believe in traditional values and we're all going for Trump. The third one was a very nice policeman. Um, <laughs> I told him, I said, you know, I drive all over the country, but after three stops, I think I'm going to stay home. Um, he laughed, and he was quite reflective. And I asked him the question. He said, I, uh, I wish I didn't have to vote for either one, but <clears throat> begrudgingly, I'll probably go Trump. So you can read all the polls. Look at CNN. Look at uh, uh, all the pollsters. They're all saying it's a dead heat, and that's probably accurate in terms of the data they have right now. But if I was a betting man in Vegas, and I'm not, i put what little money I have on Trump and wouldn't even blink. Now, I could be wrong, and then I'll eat crow for the next five or ten years if I'm even alive that long. But that's my expectation. Um, where am I? Okay, so here are the ten stages. Birth pangs, number one. Second, the apostasy. Third, the rise, the rapid rise of Antichrist, now, not just being on scene, but rise in power. We're just about to see that November 5th. Fourth, the rescue, the rapture. Uh, Christ comes back for his church. Then five, the tribulation. Not the great tribulation. I, I separate them. First three and a half years, pretty rough. I'd probably equate that with the trumpet judgments. And then six, the great tribulation <clears throat> that I would speculate <clears throat> have to do with the bold judgments that are so severe if God hadn't ended and shortened them, everybody would be dead. Uh, man and beast alike. Uh, six. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Seventh, the return. Then a, uh, the Great Tribulation, Christ returns at the end of that. And so I do. The rapture event is not when Christ sets his feet down. He's in the sky, in the air. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John. You can read the corroborating accounts. He doesn't come to earth. He comes to the clouds where we meet him. Big, that's a big point. The return, though, is when he comes and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. And uh, then uh, that seventh, eighth is the millennial kingdom. I've studied the early church, uh, thanks to uh, 
a dear friend of mine who did an excellent study of early church theology and eschatology. Uh, they taught the, the literal millennial kingdom. So if your pastor is saying it's just a bunch of mush, it doesn't mean anything, get another church. Uh, ninth, the last rebellion. This puzzles the heck out of me. At the end of the millennium, a description of Rosh, again, the, 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 the evil that's still in, it's still even at the end of the millennium where Christ rules with a rod of iron, it's still possible to rebel. It's not the perfected universe quite yet. And so he takes care of that last rebellion at the end of the, uh, at the end of the millennial thousand years. And then finally, eternity. And I, I liked the movie when I saw it many years ago to eternity and to infinity and beyond. Um, I don't have words to describe that. I just know I want to be there with him to do it. Now I don't think we're going to sit on clouds stroking a harp. That's nonsense. I've gathered over the centuries that I've been on the earth. I think that whatever we're doing now, if you're into music, if you're in teaching, if you're into building, if you're in maintenance, if you're into law, if you're, I think it may have something to do with what we'll do in eternity in perfected fashion as we learn from the Lord forever and ever and ever. And even that will not be long enough to learn everything he knows. <coughs> Final thoughts. Still okay on time. The Olivet Discourse. If you want to get a foothold on the beginning of all of this, I, I advise you study Matthew 24's version of the Olivet Discourse. It's also in Luke 21 and Mark 13. That's, that's a foundation, if you will, for New Testament eschatology when Jesus answered his disciples in a very personal way. Master, what will be the end of all things? And, you know, your, your return or whatever the wording was. I'm sorry, I don't have it on paper. And then he goes into the Olivet Discourse for the next 40 or 50 scriptures. You've got to, you've got to understand that at least fundamentally <coughs> to begin to understand what we're discussing here today. <coughs> Second point I make, <coughs> oh, I, I have a summary. Many false Christs, civil and international conflict, more pestilence, food shortages, scarcity of commodities, family disintegration. Hadn't mentioned that before until now. Happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere. Splitting churches, splitting families, brother against brother. Jesus talked about that. Mother against daughter, uh, sister-in-law against, you know, it goes on and on. And he couples that with a warning. By the way, if you do not war love me, Jesus Christ, more than mother, daughter, father, son, in-law, cousins, akin, family, you're not worthy for the kingdom of God and you will not go home in the rapture. If he's not preeminent in all of your loves, that's the word of the Lord, not mine. <clears throat> so uh, family disintegration and churches shutting down. Um, already begun. The collapse of orthodoxy is the second closing point, primarily in the form of a vicious Christian nationalism. Look, Christian, American Christian nationalism is almost identical to uh, what Hitler designed uh, in Germany in his socialist movement, national, national socialism, very similar wording. It's exactly the same thing. Um, don't have to take my word for it. I've asked everybody, ask Jesus, ask him, do a little study, read a little history. <clears throat> and I have a couple here, a couplet. As the founders predicted in relation to Christian nationalism, which is a devastation of the biblical canon, it just, it just, I could use strong language, but I better not. It annihilates it. As the founders predicted, I learned over the years of study before I even did this book, America, if there came a time the founders warned rightly that if America ever lost her sense of biblical virtue, we were done. In the words of... Uh, William Yates' poem that I've quoted a couple of times, The Second Coming. This would be the re result of a rapid collapse if the virtue, biblical virtue departed from us. Things fall apart. The center can no longer hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And the best of men lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate, misled intensity. 
that's already started. That's already started. I see it among Christian Trumpers, the absence of logic, reason, conversation. It's all emotional. It's all nationalistic. It's all flag and patriotism. And yeah, it's chilling because we've seen it before in history in the last century. The coronavirus plague figures more importantly to me as I reflect because of the, uh, the fourth seal, the seal of plague and pestilence, another harbinger, another warning. More of that's going to come. Uh, and so I'm most concerned about the Christian movement against all medical vaccinations. And I understand I'm no fan of the medical industry's profit, profit making. I'm not. I get that, but I'm not going to stop. I mean, the vaccine saved my life and about uncountable tens of millions of others. And uh, the heart of this in the church, I have one word, I should have put it up front, rebellion. The American church is in rebellion against Christ, against truth, against their neighbor. And if you understand what the two greatest commandments were, you understand y'all are in a lot of trouble in that rebellion. And it's going to exclude you from everything you believe you deserve today. Uh, the rise of Christian nationalism I make much of in the book. Threats against non-whites, non-Christians, immigrants, racial supremacy, censorial anti-Semitism, and intensification of hatred towards Zionism and Israel's right to exist. Some of that's even in my family. We're having a number of debates. The great apostasy, as I close to repeat it, there's a French word that Paul, uh, excuse me, Philip Johnson's excellent book, Modern Times, 1983, used, De Grin Golad, which is a precipitous decline of de or deterioration from a former healthy condition. That's the state of America today. <clears throat> <clears throat> the Greek term apostasia, to get down to the meat of it, is the uniquely massive revolt or rejection of the faith once, one once held to embrace either a secular atheism or more often a syncretized hybrid of some Christian ideas blended with what reduced to New Age spirituality of some. <clears throat> you hear that when you say, you know, are you a believer? Well, I'm spiritual. I'm very spiritual. And finally, Babylon the Great. The most controversial thing perhaps I say in all the book, and it took me 10 years to get, ah, more like 30. When David Wilkerson first broached this idea in 1973 that America was Babylon and New York City was probably the central location of it, I thought the guy was mad. I'm not sure if I threw away his book or thought he was crazy. <clears throat> Told my friends and family, this guy's a lunatic. He was no lunatic. I've done more study now on the reasons and the theological framework for what constitutes American Babylon. If you want the details, <laughs> think about American New York City and then read Revelation 17 and 18 very carefully and do a little checklist. Run up to Christ's return. I conclude with in less than 10 years, uh, the economy has gone from when I first thought about this in 2015 <clears throat> the economy was, by comparison, fairly stable. Divisiveness over Obama was evident, but nothing like we see today. The quality of life index ranked in 2015. The United States is number four of 86 nations. I think we're down about 27, 8 or 9 today. This has all happened quickly. Christian unity, we had a false unity, it turns out, on reflection, for most of my uh, generations before me. Uh, was more in evidence. So two days that changed America forever, June 21, 2016, when 1,000 Christian leaders, you could name them, it's all published, all 1,000. At first it was a small group followed by a, a couple of hundred, then all 1,000 within three months, agreed to an agreement, a covenant, if you will. <clears throat> I think of it as a covenant with death. When they agreed to support Donald Trump and he in return would protect Christianity, which apparently needed a lot of protection. You couldn't even say Merry Christmas, apparently. Gosh, I didn't know that. And they signed on. June 21, 2016, the other day that changed America. <clears throat> Another harbinger was January 6, 2021. <clears throat> the attempted overthrow, a coup d'etat, to overthrow the election, the Constitution, and kick out the president. Uh, I've detailed it before. <clears throat> I'm doing the book about the number of people harmed, injured, and killed 
in that first insurrection. The breach. I quote here as I close Samuel Adams' letter to James Warren, November 4th, 1775, wisdom that's been lost on the American church forever, apparently. We may look up to armies for our defense, but virtue is our best and only security. That's gone from America. It's gone as of 2020 for all intents and purposes. It doesn't exist anymore except in the remnant church, that tiny minority around the world that is not going to be forced to bow or live under a dictator. America's last days, I quote this <clears throat> from the concluding pages of my book, in this crucial hour of American history, I can say with nearly absolute certainty that if the Republic continues on the downward path to lawless sedition of what the father of American conservatism, Russell Kirk, once called the roots of American order in 1974, that America shall have willfully dis destroyed herself in a brazen and largely mindless national suicide. There's a codicil of hope, of course, because God's always in the equation if you will look to him. This is from Isaiah 1.9, and this gives me enormous comfort. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant of survivors, we would have been like Sodom, and we would have been like Gomorrah. And that's what America is going to become, if only the remnant are the ones who are going to be saved. So I conclude, finally, that's three, four conclusions, you know me. Aspire to the faithful remnant for the days ahead, and I promise you shall not be disappointed, nor will you ever be a disappointment to the one who has called each and every one, one of us for such a time as this. It's a great honor to be here now. Doesn't feel like it but it is. He chose us to be here. He wants us to be true to the remnant vision of the last day's church. And as Rosalind will tell you in the follow-up to this, I, I'm telling the truth that I've never experienced more joy since losing all my jobs and most of my material holdings and having him rebuild my life uh, around him than I have before. I mean that. I would never lie to you. I know Jesus is listening to every word. And as I often say, I'm more scared of him and love him more than I do you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this special time. A presentation from Glen Elder, Kansas. My dad was born just up the road here at a place called Phillipsburg, about 80 miles uh, to the northeast. I want to visit that town on the way home. Um, the biggest influence in my life before I met Christ was dad and mom. And uh, I'm happy to broadcast this from there. Uh, I'm excited about what Rosalind's going to present in uh, down-to-earth, professional, but real-life terms about what's coming and how to get prepared and what comes next. Um, I will end with the only difference is, and it's not a big one, she may be right. I say that everybody has to prepare for 30 days off the grid. She's got a much longer-term vision for that, and I would ask everybody in the audience just pray and ask for God's leading for each family. Bless this time, bless these broadcasts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Love you all, and uh, I'll go and try to upload this stuff straight away.